I have an idea for uh, how to deal with uh, the police and uh, the race relations and all this stuff, trying to trying to catch criminals and things like that. It's, um, this is an idea, and I don't know if they've tried this before, but how about a mandatory dress code um, require of the community to negotiate with them, determine what is a good dress code, and in this dress code, it has to make it completely... Uh, the pockets would have to be revealed on the outside of the dress. The dress would have to make it very difficult. Say it's a pullover top rather than using a zipper or buttons. Um, and it would make it difficult to get access to the gun. Um, say that the, the kind of pants that you would use would be spandex. Uh, something that would be form revealing. And... Uh, and you would have a reason to suspect that someone is a criminal if they didn't abide by the dress code. And then you would put signs up all around the community that says we enforce a strict dress code and then give like a special little code that would uh, you would point your cell phone at and it would help you to determine what the mandatory dress code was um, to avoid getting stopped by policemen. Also, if anybody's carrying uh, extra baggage with them, that they use a, a, a wheel cart and that their luggage have padlocks on it. See, what you're doing is you're reducing the accessibility factor, um, making it easy to conceal a weapon, making it easy to access a weapon. If you reduce, and the other th advantage of this is, is that um, if you pull somebody, if you pull somebody over, well, not for a car, but if you, if somebody's walking on the street and um, and um, they're not abiding by the dress code, you can pull them. You can bring them over and say you're not abiding by the dress code, and they see then they don't have the stipulate. They don't have the um, the point, or they can't take the approach that you stopped them over because of race, but because of dress code. So dress code something you can change. Race is not something you can change. And so um, they have the power to change their dress code. They don't have power to change their race. Um, so you can't stop them on race, but you can stop them on dress code. That's, that's some they can control. And if you tell the community there is a specific dress code and everybody abides by that, um, then you can determine who's a part of your community. For one thing, you can, you can identify foreign um, people, people that are not from your community, they're there. Um, if they get stopped there, they don't have a reason of race. The police can just point out that you're not abiding by the dress code. And um, curfews could be another thing, but the thing is, is that you would, um, that if everybody abided by that in the community, then they would know that they're not going to get pulled over, they're not going to get stopped by the police because the police are going to be looking for people that are not abiding by the dress code that are wearing um, dress that makes it extremely hard to conceal weapons and if I mean they and the people can't be carrying around um, they could be carrying around a boom box or something like that but it would make them more suspect um, the more things they have on them um, if somebody's walking down the street and they simply have the dress code then um, and and they're just and they understand that the police would stop them if they didn't have a necessary dress code, um, if they had anything extra, you know. I I guess that would prevent you from carrying uh, groceries home. But then I said you could have a like a lock box and put a padlock on it and wheel your your groceries home. Why hold them in your hands if somebody's going to confront you with a gun? Um, if you're holding your groceries in your hands, then you are, you're empty handed. You're a sitting duck. You don't have the option to use your hands. Okay. So you don't, so it makes you more, um, susceptible and, and vulnerable if your hands are accessible. You know, I mean, if your hands aren't accessible to dealing with the situation, you know, like picking up a rock and hitting the guy over the head. You can't do those things because you're holding groceries, you know. And so the thing is that you, the cops can can pretty much avoid 
the excuse that there's that they're being that you're being that they're they're uh, um, honing on on you because of race. Um, it it doesn't give you that that card to play, and um, that's how you deal with that problem. So it's an idea um, in such communities. I was watching a frontline, or I think it was frontline documentary, a guy that was talking about. Um, the crime problem in Newark and and showing when the policeman would go and stop somebody and if they if the person wasn't standing still and showing their hands and then the policeman would think that they had something to hide and then they would bring them to the ground and handcuff them um, but how many of these I, I don't know if they've tried a dress code you know it's it's a method of dealing with such situations um, I just you know, I have a tendency to kind of stamp out of the situation and try to determine if there's a way that you can make it more difficult for someone to um, to to wield a weapon, to um, you know, to carry out. And, and look, if they had blood on them, it would be obvious that the clothes were not clean, and you know, cleanliness would be part of the dress code. I'm sure. You know that they were wearing a full color um, like a, a suit that has no zippers on it it's a pullover top and um, it is not a sweatshirt or anything like that they may discuss that they might not have the money to do it but you could always find options you could go to the clothing stores and, and negotiate with them options on uh, dress code that would be inexpensive to implement and uh, and, um, you know, it could be something as simple as making the pullover top spandex, making the, the, the um, pantsy wear spandex, you know. And if you were overweight, then uh, it could be something different, like uh, the kind of garb that people who are Muslim use, um, a, long, a long dress or a long cloak. So but something that doesn't have any, um, any pockets. Because the pockets are where you would conceal the weapon, um, and if they had hole in their clothes, you could probably identify that fact. You would also say that the uh, that the clothing can't be black um, because blackness can help you conceal weapons. So the idea is that you focus in you focus in on the clothing as being the method of determining whether or not they have weapons on them not their behavior not their race you see because if you hone in on the on the clothes then they have no cards to play um, that are about race or um, about sex or you know fashion is not one of those things that determine um, prejudice you know um, you People can have the ability to do different fashion, but in certain communities where they would be concerned about the security, they could use a dress code as and and the way that people present themselves as a way of avoiding being pulled over by police officers, um, requiring that the vehicles not have tinted glass, um, uh, that sort of thing, and I mean. If, if if the people were in a vehicle and uh, somebody identified the vehicle as um, a drive-by shooting, then uh, you could use other uh, options for the vehicles like um, decals or um, or you could take the serial number of the of the tires and the rims and and the vehicle itself. Just make it very difficult. Even plant on the vehicle um, special. You know, if you could uh, spray on a particular type of, um, of symbol or something that you could only see, say, under a ultraviolet light, or maybe it's just microcode, or maybe it's just a chip uh, located in a particular part of the vehicle that the uh, person wouldn't know about, and they couldn't, I mean, it's not going to prevent their ability, but it will permit you the ability to identify their, their, their vehicle. You know, and not disclose to them what it was that you 
the information collected about their vehicle to determine so they wouldn't know what to conceal on the vehicle. And um, if they were to use the vehicle, well, you could impound the vehicle. That's one thing to do. But if they were to get the vehicle back, then uh, they you would collect certain information about the vehicle and make it very difficult for them to to eliminate um, the identity of the vehicle. So the next time a crime is performed and and it still has the same ownership and all that stuff, um, they would be more suspect, you know. And so you focus on the things you don't focus on the people. Okay, um, you you would focus on ownership, but that's still not race. It's not uh, discrimination by race. I don't think you could discriminate by fashion unless they were Muslims, but you know, in this day with COVID, people can hide their face, they can hide, you know, it's going to make it a lot easier for Muslims to be a part of the communities. And I think that's a good thing, actually, um, that, that, pe that anybody could dress like a Muslim. And that would probably make it a lot easier for Muslims to accept um, our society because the reason why they dress that way is to prevent the men from lusting after the women. It's, it's really to protect the women, to protect um, their, to, to prevent uh, men from being, from uh, wanting to say rape them or something like that. Um, if they're covered well, then there really is nothing about them that would make them attractive to the men. And that's the reason why their religion is that way, why they require that kind of garb, I'm sure, is to prevent, um, is to prevent that kind of behavior, you know, to make it really easy for people to be more focused on their God than to uh, be focused on their presentation. And, and for women, um, if you look at the sex symbol for a woman, what it is, is it's a vanity mirror. For a man, it is a um, spear and a shield. That's what those symbols represent. That's how you know which one was which. And um, the thing is, is that it's always, I guess, been true that women tend to be concerned about their looks. And if they're covered with garb, then they don't really have to prepare their makeup or anything they they can go out and and be businesswoman and not be discriminated against uh you know because they really cover it up they just it's um i think it's a good thing and i think that when we look at the muslim people just because of their change in garb we could be inspired by their their um by their fashion you know this could be a good thing to to, to be inspired by, it. it could form the way that people dress in the future, that we take on part of their garb. That would be, I think that would change their viewpoint on us, is if we started looking more like them. And um, that's how you eliminate the, um, the, the boundaries between races. You eliminate the, the things that people can discuss as being race related, you know, um, the more closer you can come to realize that people are like yourselves, the more you're going to eliminate the prejudice and the racism. Uh, another thing I know of people in the South is they don't tend to leave the country. They don't tend to go out and uh, visit other nations and explore. Um, they tend to live in the South most of their life. And that's a recipe for racism, you know, is that you're not going to go outside of your boundary of uh, comfort. You're not going to go to France. And so if you're not going to go to France, you're never going to understand that France, French people are like you. If you're never going to go to Africa, you're never going to realize that African people are like you. And so the, the um, nationality and, and racism and all that stuff could basically be melted away into nothing by permitting these people to um, not have ignorance as a fallback. See, conservatism breeds ignorance because um, in conservatism, you prefer the environment that you've always had. And so diversity is something you associate with the liberals. And you 
conservatives don't tend to don't seem to like really accept uh, diversity. They don't accept different ideas. They're not going to accept other cultures if um, if they don't permit themselves to step out the bounds of their own culture. And that's kind of what conservatism does. It is not good. Um, it's best to be a combination of a conservative and a liberal. The conservative uh, strong point is um, standardizing, making things, um, having set standards of things that should always be true. And um, those are the things you should be conservative on, not conservative on um, a preference for a tradition, a preference for a behavior, a preference for things like that. You should be conservative on the points of, uh, of um, finding things that work and sticking to them, finding, uh, identifying good ideals and sticking to them. That's good for, that's a good way of doing conservatism. Complacency is really bad, okay? And the other thing is, is that there are conservative, fiscal conservatives, um, business conservatives, that will do things that are very liberal, such as what Tyson does to its, um, to his, uh, the people that raises its chickens. They don't give them incentives. But what they do is they take money from the people that they penalize the people who don't produce enough chickens. They take money from them or they don't pay them enough. They're essentially taking money from them and then they're redistributing it to the people that do well, which is socialism. And, uh, but I'm sure Tyson thinks of them as fiscal conservatives. And it's, it's, um, it's a two-faced approach. It's like they're gonna be liberal whenever it's in their favor, but they're gonna be conservative when um, they're doing public relations because they're in the South or they're, they're among people who prefer a conservative approach, you know, embracing things that have always worked and, you know, doing things and good in that. But the, it doesn't seem like it, even the conservative Christians don't even really read the Bible, it seems or even like really consider all of the attributes of what have been done in the New Testament, or even understand that the Old Testament is not, that, that, that Christian, Christianity is not about following law. Um, the whole Old Testament, the, the idea behind the Old Testament is that um, you can't live by a theocracy. You can't have God there the whole time guiding you all the way, and holding your hand. It doesn't work. Hand-holding doesn't work. And, um, and, you know, laws don't work because somebody's going to find loopholes and they're going to use those loopholes to justify actions that are outside of the intent of the laws in the first place. And so really what the New Testament is and what Jesus is bringing about is he's bringing around philosophy rather than laws. And the philosophy is, is ways of understanding how to recognize good behavior and how to recognize bad behavior. Not, and it isn't about going out and, and, um, and being aggressive towards somebody and forcing them to, to abide by a law because laws don't work. Behaviors work. Um, recognizing behaviors is the way that you, it's, you avoid people who have bad behavior. You don't hang around them. That's how you're able to maintain your um, to to maintain the people and involve being involved with the people and changing the behavior, changing the culture. Anytime you come in contact with somebody that's of a different culture, you're going to find things that are differences between you, and that may give you an excuse, a reason to doubt them, and um, it is not a good a good way of of dealing with culture, the best thing to do is to find your where you meet, where you intersect, and then to limit your own culture to meet the culture uh, requirements of the culture you come in contact with, at least enough just to get them to understand your culture. And once they understand, they may actually take on the attributes of your culture once they're within your country, you see. But by meeting them halfway, you're, it's good apologetics. It's a good way of bringing people 
to the table, bringing people to your point of view. And um, the problem with the conservative viewpoint is, is that if you don't abide by our law, then you might as well not be here. That's a very aggressive and a very, um, it's unkind. It's a very, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a viewpoint, it's offensive, okay? Now, people will tell me it's offensive to talk politics and religions, but um, all in all, both politics and religion is philosophy. It's ideas. And if you're not capable of spreading ideas, then you're not communicating. And communication is the basis of most divorce. It's a lack of communication that uh, in, that um, brings people to divorce each other is because they have the incapacity to actually hear each other, to perceive what the other is saying. And the reason why is because they've had so many arguments and they've developed ideas and they haven't developed the idea that the other person might have developed a, a different idea around what they're saying. One way of dealing with that problem is to change your language whenever you discuss things, to take on a different lexical set of language so that you're bringing to the table new ideas, but it may just be that you're talking about the same stuff, but you're saying it in a different a different way. You're bringing about to, you, you might define the words so that they, and and by using different words than the person that you're with will probably start to have to understand the words. And then they go to understand the words and then they start to see in the words the details and the language and the ideas that you're wrapped up in them so that they can finally understand what it is that you're saying. Because it may be a problem with the culture that you took them out of and married them from that is preventing them from actually hearing what you're saying. Um, but if it's obvious what the the problem is, um, there may be approaches to that even, you know. It may be necessary to go to a, to a marriage counselor and maybe a psychologist to try to determine if there would be a different approach that would be more, um, that would make it make it comfortable for each party um but it says and i keep bringing this up that uh, jesus said to peter when peter cut off the ear of the soldier and this is just an idea it's not whether or not it's true it is it is an idea it's philosophy okay if um and so a lot of stories and cultures are to express philosophy it's not to express whether or not it's true uh, it's to express the philosophy, the ideals, okay? And just as Jesus said to the possible apostles, um, take of my flesh and eat it, take of my blood and drink it, they thought he was talking cannibalism at first. And then after a while, they came to the realization that he, they, that he was communicating an idea through just a different set of words. And he had loaded up into these words different meanings so that he could present an idea to them that they would not otherwise have been able to accept. Uh, had he done it by other means, it probably would have been too complex to, to describe. And so the solution there is to bring about a different, a different language, a different way of expressing yourself. Um, but anyhow, um, yeah, so the thing is, is that um, I think how we could improve the South is by making Southern people more um, first in education, becoming more educated, requiring better education, requiring um, possibly an extra language, possibly um, becoming more versed and not just accepting people who have dropped out of junior high or college. I mean, out of high school, that people have at least had high school. And if they haven't had high school, then you push them back into school, you know. Um, I know it's, the thing is, is that if people don't have the capacity to go through school, then they don't really have the capacity to survive in our society unless they are to be taken care of by others they they're going to become 
homeless. They're going to become parasite. They're going to have a parasitic lifestyle where they're living off of their parents, and um, that see what you do there is that you're making the parents responsible for the children. The children have to get educated, you know, because if they fall out of school, then they become dependent on the on the parents. And then the parents have an ultimatum. They can either take care of the children or they can or they can uh, send them to foster care. See? And um, if they're old enough that they're beyond the age of 18, um, then the government might require them to go to school in order to take on a job, you know. And, and then you put in the requirements for all jobs that people be educated up to a high school level. Um, and in that, by becoming more educated, becoming a little bit more intellectual, they're able to take on different cultures of people coming into the country. They're able to understand they're not, they can't claim ignorance. Uh, and the worst part of conservatism is claiming ignorance. It's hiding within the bounds of conservatism and, and remaining ignorant, um, having a simplicity of presentation. Uh, simplicity is fine um, whenever people are interacting, but if they don't have the proper, um, if they don't, if they're not able to describe themselves, unless they're handicapped, it's really, there's really no excuse for it. It is their preference to be ignorant. And if they're going to prefer to be ignorant, then the employees have the, have the capacity to prefer um, to prefer um, to pay them less, to prefer to the, you know, and the thing is, is that they become the poverty, they become the poor, um, and they have no excuse to say that they couldn't do it better, and that is to accept the education. We not need to offer them the education, the capacity to do better, um, but we, but they shouldn't have the capacity to use cards like race and, and, um, and, um, you know, use, if they, if it's, if it's something they can change, they can't, they can't use that, they can't use that card. If, if it's something they can't change, then that's something they can use as discrimination. Discrimination should only be about things that can't be changed. I mean, yeah. Um, that if you can change something, then that's not reasons for discrimination. Uh, however, religion is, uh, is and because um, there are people who can't change religion because some religions are, um, some religions restrict people's ability to choose. And there, there may be grounds on doing, on controlling that, but, um, you know, by saying that what is, cultish behavior of religions and what are religious, what are accurate, good religious behaviors, people can, can, um, follow a religion. Um, it's philosophy, it's ideas. It's, um, when, you, when you have a certain behavior, you can't discriminate somebody on behavior. Um, and religion is behavior. Um, you can discriminate people on, on, uh, on uh, not abiding by dress codes and and things that are important to a community of the place where you live, just the same way that you can't have a house with a lawn that's going out of control. Um, however, what you could do is you could add little things that if your if your lawn is going to be out of control, at least put shrubs around it or a, or a picket fence so that it hides that from the people on the street so that people are not bothered by the way your house looks, that you're hiding the, the ugly features. And um, so, you know, there are some people that even in religions that uh, on a sabbatical year, you have to let your land go fallow. And so your land is gonna go out of control. And then the government comes in and says, well, you can't let your land do that. That's a religious discrimination, see? And so then you would probably just have to put a fence around your land. 
and that's the way that you could per, that be permitted to um, to live by that standard and still be compliant with the guidelines of the of the particular county um, and then you could have inspectors that would go throughout the states and stuff to determine if the sorts of um, dress codes or the various ways that they're trying to maintain um, trying to ma maintain it a a form that people can control but permits them to crack down on crime to identify people that are outside of their community to to be able to track the people that are strangers um, they can um, they can do that and and then you don't have those cards that you can put out that it's about race or it's about uh, sexual practice it's um, sexual identity um, if somebody chose, chooses to be um, transsexual at least abide by the dress code that they're going to pick that you can't discriminate them on their their sexual preference you can't discriminate them on the way that they want to look um, in terms of whether being a female or male um, you dis you discriminate them based upon whether or not they're abiding by the standards that the community has set up for dress code in order to prevent the accessibility to weapons and the accessibility to hiding places for drugs and things like that. Now, my stance on drugs is that um, there really should, what we really should do implement in this country is the kind of ways that they deal with drugs in Amsterdam. They don't let people do cocaine anywhere. They let people do cocaine in the back of a bar. And you can only do a certain amount of cocaine. You know, you can't just you can't just overdose on cocaine. You can only do a certain amount, and that's the amount to get a hit, okay, to get your fix. And um, and if you do that, then people are still able to get access to their drugs. Um, and I really think people should be able to access cocaine the same way that people are able to access alcohol or cigarettes. And... I mean, cocaine, all those are destructive. Marijuana is the only one that's not really all that destructive to people. And we have a stigma in our, in our country against drugs. And look, if, if God didn't want people to have drugs, he wouldn't have created these plants. I mean, the poppy is just so obvious that it's, it's got medicinal drug values to it. it, it was, it's been made for the opiate. It, and the opiates are used in our hospitals in order to treat people who are undergo painful surgery, and so if that was not um, a if that was not something that God wanted us to have, why would He have created it? Um, if our genitalia were not accessible to our hands, why would masturbation be a problem? Why would you know pornography is a problem if you consider that it might cause you to lust after somebody else's um, partners, you see. And when it says in the Bible that you look at a woman, if you look at a woman, you've committed adultery, um, keep in mind that if you were to look at a woman when that was written, you're not looking at a picture of a woman, you're looking at a woman, okay? And you're you're expressing with your eyes you've already committed adultery um looking at a picture i don't see is the same thing you know and it's it's open to interpretation and it also says in the bible anywhere two of you are there i am that means that if any of you agree on something then jesus has the capacity to be there with you in in deciding it okay so the Christian religion is open up to to culture differences, you know. It it can travel with the culture. The overall point is is that you understand that um you ha are free from discrimination by God and that you have that the only stipulation is that you love people and you treat them as you do yourself. So pornography is not a problem. Um it, it, the acts that are performed in the pornography are a problem. 
because the people, what they're doing to each other is, is nasty. And, but there are ways of getting around that. If you look at VR porn, um, a Czech VR is doing a kind of a VR porn that I particularly like, and it is just basically intimacy. It's just being close to a beautiful person. And you might masturbate to that, and and you get your fix, um, and you're out of there, but you're not compelled to go and do it with um, your neighbor's wife. It's coveting. It's 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 you know the 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 only way that you could take this a bad way is to say that it that that lust or whatever would cause you to pull you away from God, and so that is. Um, but I mean, you just look at King King Solomon. You look at King David. Um, David had five wives. You know, how do you get over the idea that David had polygamy? You know, there's advantages to polygamy whenever you're a king, and that is is that you have those five wives that are going to bring about a kind of a democracy because they're each going to have a viewpoint, and your decisions are going to be weighed by those wives. Okay. That's a way, and that's that's the reason why you need to permit polygamy among people in there in the Middle East is so that they can bring about democracy into their nation through the women that are married, uh, that that men marry, and they, the men will come to respect them the same way that um, uh, Esther was respected in the Old Testament. Uh, there's lots of great ideas that come out of the Bible, and it's good philosophy. There's no real reason to like discount it because it's you don't believe that the things actually occurred or things like that. It's ideas and there's they're loaded ideas. You might come to believe those ideas and and take on the religion, or you can you can go away from it, but you should be permitted to go away from it so that you might be attracted to it later when you come to realize that it might actually be the truth. So that's the thing about philosophy is, is that you share it and people will determine among themselves what works and what doesn't, what's good and what's bad. And um, if, if the Christian philosophy is dominant in our world, it's probably because it works. And that's where the conservatives would have a, a, a strong point. Um, but then you have to do the iron sharpens iron. You have to understand something about their religion, about their culture, so that you can keep them in check. You know, if they come towards you and they say something, then you have to say, like if they're super self-righteous and they come out and they say, well, you're going to hell. And then I say, you're doing the exact same thing the Pharisees were doing. This is the reason why Jesus had this viewpoint. Um, if they're saying, well, buy the book, the Christian books, the Bibles in our in our church, and I said, "Well, then you're doing what the money changers were doing when, when uh, Jesus went and overthrew the tables. You could have a different viewpoint, and you could cause them to think about their religion. It makes them better at their religion. It makes them more conservative because they think by being conservative, they're by they think they've come to water down their own conservatism." And so you're putting them in their place. They're, you're getting them to understand that they're not abiding by what they think they are, that they're using vanity, and that's what the Pharisees did. They, they used the, the way that they looked to, to influence people. They did, but inside, according to Jesus, they were filled with so much filth. And it's like, how can you say this to people whenever inside you were this way? And there's a part in the Bible that says even the, the things that you have hidden, that someday they will be shouted from rooftops. And so my approach to that is, is that the little thing that I've hidden from the world, I'm just going to make them known because um, I just want to diffuse the potential for blackmail in the future. Um, if people understand the things I'm saying is to be true, then they're really not going to be able to have much of a point to blackmail me because then they would have to prove to me that I didn't have just points of view. If I don't have a just point of view, then I would ask, I would rec uh, I would want people to rebuke me and to give me different viewpoints. And I would be receptive to that. I would be listening to them. Um, 
but the, the thing is, is that we don't listen enough. We choose to hear what we want to hear, and that's what's ruling pretty much our country is, is um, that we are getting on the internet, and we're picking and choosing who we want to listen to, and we're trying to find those loopholes, the things that we can we can argue against other people to prevent them from having a leg up on us so that we can win whatever war it is we think we're winning. But to keep in mind that you're not winning with them. You're winning with yourself. And it's it's a form of um it's a form of self self delusion. It's a it's kind of lying to yourself, really. And it's lying to yourself that that you think that you're going to have you're going to have uh, influence and you're not influencing the people that you're trying to influence. You're making, you're distancing them. You're, you're making them. And that's, and I'm guilty of it myself. I will get upset, but I try not to get upset at people. I get upset, uh, upset against organizations, against collections of people. So I'll say Christians. I won't say specific Christians. I will say Christians. If I, if I get, mad at a manufacturer I'll get mad at the manufacturer I'll say you're doing these things wrong with your product if I have a point if I'm telling the things that I'm that are causing me to be angry rather than just that it's bad chemistry then they know where to fix their problems um, you have to have a point if you don't have a point then it, there's people are not going to listen to you if there are people discussing their differences between their religions or their viewpoints, and you have that one random guy that comes up and says, who doesn't believe in religion or doesn't believe in, in the viewpoints, will say, you guys are all crazy. Then you say, you turn to him, all the guys turn to him and say, well, that rules you out. And so that guy just um, got excommunicated from the whole discussion, you see. And they learn from that. They learn that you can't come in to a discussion among people who are trying to understand each other and tell everybody you're all crazy so there's different approaches and and Jesus had some of these approaches then but I don't think Jesus would really hold you to I mean there are things in the Bible that says you're supposed to you're supposed to run away from sin um, and that's when you can there are some things you can't change and um, that's between you and them. I mean, that's between you and God. That's between you and Jesus, you know. And even if you don't believe it now, there's 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 loopholes in there for you. That you don't have to um, live by the Christian example if you don't believe it. Um, if someday in the future you do believe, or you just end up doing the things that are according to their religion without literally believing it. If somewhere down the road, say on your deathbed, you say you believe, then that's good enough for them. They don't need to have you. And the thing is, is they can't discriminate against you um, saying you're not Christian because they don't know. You see? So, and I don't think that Christians should have crosses around their necks because it's really kind of hiding. It's using their religion as a crutch. Um, it's saying I'm a part of the clique. I don't have any reason to really abide by this clique, okay? Um, it may say they're a good person, but there are demons that can hide behind crosses too. And so the thing is, is that determine your Christ-like attributes by how you treat people. Um, try to treat people better. If you must rebuke, rebuke. But don't, don't rebuke on points that people can't change. And, and don't just say that people can't, will never be able to change. I could say that I probably will never buy anything from a certain manufacturer, but that's just a manufacturer. That's not the people. That's the company. That's that company's style. Um, now, whenever I got a problem with Trump, I will describe what the problems are that, with Trump. And that's something he can change. But if he doesn't want to change those things, he's not going to make an inroad with me, but he can take it or leave it. It's not going to determine 
his relationship with God, it's just going to determine whether or not I want to be around him or even in the country when he's a president, you know. Um, I have that choice. And I'm not any lesser of a human being because I don't like him, you know. Um, you love, you got to love your enemies, but you, but you don't have to, you don't have to hang out with them, okay? You, you can love with them, you can love them, you can send them gifts, you can hope that they would become closer to you, but it's just as God is, he, God isn't going to chase you down. Um, uh, God has got his hand open to accept you, but if you want to go away, he can't follow you because you're against his will. You know, it's... So I have the power to evangelize, I know, but I'm not a, I'm not really a very good Christian. I, and I will say that up front, that, I, that I'm probably kind of on the outside, uh, a, a Christian on the outside, I'm, if I'm a Christian at all. I'm a Christian on the outside. I'm someone who has the potential of going to hell. But the thing is, is that I'm taking the standpoint that, I'll, that I'm not going to let religion define me. I'm not going to let, I mean, I'm not going to let any of that stuff define me. Um, I'm going to, um, go by my own behavior and in my behavior, I tend to be very empathetic. Uh, there was one time I stepped on a baby bird and cried for two weeks. It was a proof to me that I did have empathy, you know, but the thing is, is that when you've seen enough porn as much as I've seen, um, you tend to wonder if, if, you have any empathy because when you're in the throes of an addiction um you the addiction is controlling you pretty much until you get your fix and then your brain kind of just switches and and you're just like you know you don't want to be around it and you want to go and do something else um but the thing is is i've come to realization that is even if I stay, um, even if I abstain for a month, I'm back into the throes of it, and I'm even back in the throes of it, even stronger. Okay, and it, it's just going to be a, a swinging pendulum, and so I've come to realization that I have the capacity to be a bad person, but I'll do it in private, and I'll do it not involving other people. You know, it's it's something. And I'm going to be completely truthful about it because I think when you don't communicate such things, when you don't give people viewpoints on such things, then they won't have the capacity to be accepting of such parts of, of society. Um, Jesus said that, um, that there's no place you can go on earth. And basically, he was saying this to the apostles. He gave them examples, but it was basically the idea was that there's nowhere you can go on earth that is the entrance to hell. And... Um, uh, the pantheistic uh, Indian religions, they're, they're not really religions, what they are, they're superstition. And um, they worship these gods because they're trying to appease all these gods because they think somehow it's going to have some control over their environment. And there's a good way to look at that is, is that they can look at all these gods and say each one of them has a skill. And in that they probably see themselves as each having a skill each having a talent, you see. And that's how you could go about thinking them, you know, bringing Christ to them if that's what you're trying to bring to them. Um, or whatever your religion is, bringing uh, the good attributes of that. Maybe we produce another religion that is the combination of all world philosophy, okay? And we teach this in school. And then it's, you know... The idea is, is that you don't pick one philosophy over it, that, that you don't dispute the flight. You find the common ground. You find the thing that, that tends to work. And um, if, it's, if it creates good behavior and that everybody agrees with, then it's something everybody could live by. There would always be those people that are outstanding of, of that. But the, the common intersection of all those viewpoints of, the, of those ideas the common intersection, the things that everybody could live with, is where you define your civilization, define your culture um, that that people live by, the the the, the behaviors that are um, going to make people happy and and 
help people accept each other. Um, but I believe that in schools we should be teaching all philosophy, and that includes the philosophies that are in religions. Not uh, you can't take the standpoint that you're not going to learn uh, another person's religion as the basis because you don't believe that it's truth or nothing like that. If you want to be to more together with other people, you have to understand their their religion. You have to understand their philosophies. And how you negotiate with them is by understanding the complexity, the, the intersection between everybody. And and you come closer based on that. Um, so you're probably wondering where I pull all this from. I don't know where I pull this all from. Um, it's it's like I've got ideas in my head and they just fire off. And there's something in the Bible that says that uh, uh, when the teacher teaches, the the teacher also learns. And that is is that um, teachers, you know, teachers know that when they teach people, they're just thinking on the fly. And they're coming to the realizations. They're learning from the students, but they're also learning from themselves because they they're meditating, they're, they're thinking about something, and as they're thinking about it, they're starting to realize things. And then that stuff comes out of their mouth, and that's kind of what's happening with me, is that I don't even realize where, my, where all this is coming from. Um, I know that I, when I collect more information, I understand things a little bit better, and each time I instruct, I elaborate uh, or I change my position a little bit. It isn't that I'm lying. It's that I'm coming to the realization that certain uh, certain assumptions I had before were incorrect, you know. And so I'll change a little bit all the time. And I think that's good. I think that's okay. Um, I think it's a it it's okay if you're thinking on your toes. Um, there's no way you're ever going to be able to research everything. And even if you did research everything. Uh, how would you know what is being um, what is being communicated in in the in the books and rhetoric you're reading? You would have to really intensely study it and see all their interrelationships. You know, it, the only time to really be that uh, intent on things um, is when you're doing something that is going to be life-changing, something that is possibly destructive to a person's life. And, you know, med people in the medical profession can't do such things. They have to research things because the body is not going to change its, uh, its position based upon what it is, the treatment that you pick. Your body is going, is like a machine. It is going to either accept it or completely not accept it. And when it not doesn't accept it, it's called a... Um, it's called an infection, and infections can be very, they can kill you, you know. And so um, people who are doctors don't have the capacity to be kind of free with their thoughts, you know, and, and bringing together certain viewpoints. But there is a way to do that if you're in the Mayo Clinic, um, how the Mayo Clinic deals with um, diagnosing patients and things is by bringing together lots of professionals. And you might even bring in a guy who isn't a professional uh, of the sort of being a doctor, it's like somebody who is um, who is a psychologist or somebody who is a therapist. Um, they might have a perspective that is completely um, outside the box of the, of the physical and just dealing with the emotional, dealing with the the concerns, there may be something like the, the idea of being in a hospital room. Maybe it is that they don't like white walls. Maybe they don't like the, the structure of the room. Maybe they don't like being in a bed. Maybe they would prefer to be in a cou on a couch or something like that. I know that in, I've heard it that in India, when you have surgical work done on you, um, they have their hospitals are not like our hospitals their 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 rooms are more like hotel rooms and they have wait staff and then they have the nurses and so you're more comfortable 
I guess, in certain hospitals in India than you would ever be in, in a hospital in America. And that would be grounds for us to become more um, aware of how things are in other countries, how they treat people, because it's going to determine whether or not people have their their um, medical work done here or if they're done elsewhere, okay? And it's going to determine whether or not we, in the future, even though we think we're the, the greatest economy in the world, that could all change. Our nationalism, the way that we are so intent that our nation is important, that's pride, and pride can lead to war. Um, if, if somebody disses you, that can be the grounds of a war, you know? And you have to turn the other cheek. You can't, you can't let such things be life or death type things, you know? There are different people in the country that are willing to live with different amounts of um, displeasure, different amounts of, um, of respect, you know? Some people can deal with not having as much respect. You know, they can, they can become recluse. Um, but then there are those people that have such intense pride for themselves that it can be a point at which to, to, um, to lead to the failure of actually doing something very drastic. And we need to define when we're defining what's good behavior, what's good psychology, um, to define what that is so that people know if there would be any kind of discrimination in, among the society. But, you know, that may not be a very good point. But I'm just saying that this all started with me trying to deal with the problems of gun, of, of dealing with crime in communities where racism was an issue. The way to, to eliminate it is to diffuse the issue, and that is to take race out of the equation and put something in its place, which would be fashion, something you could change. Um, and then work on that to try to determine how, how much inaccessible you could make the weapon. And if the weapon was, um, say, it, if it was not in a special kind of case that made it difficult to get into, then, um, then that would be grounds for bringing somebody into jail, you know. That it, that you know, it if it had bullets in it, that would be another grounds for um, bringing somebody into jail. You know, it's okay for people to be able to defend themselves, but they could always run away from the person, which is the best approach to dealing with uh, with such crime. Is picking out your gun and, and making a good shot is not the best approach because you can always kill bystanders. You can kill people behind because the bullet can go through multiple multiple people. It doesn't stop with just one person. That's the reason why um, why gun control um, is important is that um, while people pride themselves in their ability to, um, to control crime, they don't understand that if you shoot a gun and there's somebody behind the person that you shoot, you've got the criminal, but you also got somebody who's innocent. And that's the, that's the risk you take, but it's also going to haunt you in the future. And if you think not, uh, there, you have empathy. And if you don't have empathy, you're a psychopath. And understand, 60% of the prisoners in jail are psychopaths. If you end up in jail, you're going to end up among psychopaths. And these are people that do not identify with you. A psychopath identifies with themselves. They don't, it, it's not normal for a psychopath to identify with God because God is not like them, you know. They only identify with themselves. They are their own God. And so you get stuck with that in, in a prison. It's going to change your whole viewpoint on your rights as a human because you lose them when you go to prison. You, you come you have to conform to the culture of the inmates and the policemen are not going to protect you from that. And it's, it's going to really, it, it could really stress you out. You might just die from the stress. So 
I mean, that's what I'm saying, that you have to really think about things a little bit deeply. Um, and it helps to listen to people like me. I'm not going to have all the answers. I'm, I don't even know if I have answers. I just have ideas, philosophy.